Mona Lisa is all about me. It's all about you. It's all about our stories. The stories that never get told, but ought to. Whereby water transportation does not make financial sense, it makes economic sense. I was there for two and a half hours on the floor. Nobody attempted to me. If we don't take care of the poor, the poor will take care of us. It's about getting at the root of things and hearing from the horse's mouth. We have 15 public hospitals to make them affordable. In the whole of Africa, we are bigger. You know, Nigeria, we sleep, eat, dream, fashion. Those with the uh, financial backing don't see fashion as an investment, which makes no sense. If they do it for free, they won't have money for the next case. Mona Lisa is about real life and the real lives, yours and mine. Make a date with Mona Lisa and together let's ensure that the important stories get told. Welcome to another edition of Mona Lisa, where we make it our business to keep you switched on. On today's edition, we explore our flourishing fashion industry. We talk to the big names and ask why we're yet to get the requisite investment as compared with Nollywood and our music industry. Later, we journey with an actor, an activist, who is set on lifting others out of the slum, having walked that path himself. So you see, you're right where you ought to be with Mona Lisa. The garment and footwear industry in Nigeria contributes 0.47% to the national GDP, more than is spent on our health care sector. It provides employment and promotes creativity, especially among the youth. And yet, we still hear of a lack of structure in the industry and inability to get hold of quality materials. With a focus on turning from a mono economy to promoting alternative sources of income, there has been talk and activity around pushing the Buy Nigeria initiative. Why then is our fashion industry not yet able to compete with other creative industries such as Nollywood and our music industry? We met with knowledgeable players in the industry to shed more light on the information we received so far. The fashion industry in Nigeria is a dynamic club which includes incoming designers, established designers, collaborative designers who mentor, adventurous designers, models, and so on. We explored the strengths of this expansive industry. In the whole of Africa, we are bigger than other African designers. I can tell you that authoritatively. Because, you know, Nigeria, we, we, we sleep, eat, dream fashion. The strength of the Nigerian fashion industry, I'll try to narrow it down to the fact that us Nigerians are so expressive and so passionate and are so willing to take uh, bold steps in fashion. So whether it's someone who's jumping onto a, a Danfor or, or a Molowe, someone that's uh, boarding a private jet at the airport, um, but Nigerians are fashionably adventurous. I think Nigeria is a very special country in so many ways. In the 13 years I've been in Nigeria, I saw a major change going from even the way Nigerians now relate to arts and culture. We considered its weaknesses and challenges. The challenges that I faced while setting up my label, Kiki Kamanu, NEPA. So light, and so we tend to spend a lot of resources on getting something as basic as light, and also uh, uh, distribution outlets. Well, Nigeria is definitely not the easiest place where to start a business. Uh, starting from the fact that you need to rent a place for two years, starting from the lack of light, uh, and lack of uh, skilled workforce and so you have to train them in the job and uh, especially in fashion there is no standardized production. We looked at how the fashion industry compares with other creative industries such as Nollywood and the music industry. So I've been told that uh, it seems that a Nollywood and the music industry that uh, they get more funding than, uh, 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 than those in the fashion industry. Because if people, for some reason, uh, 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 those with the uh, financial backing don't see fashion as an investment and don't see it as a business, which makes no sense. What can be done to convert potential to productivity and get us on the world stage? I'm hoping that with time we will start to collaborate with 
textile manufacturers so that we can produce exclusively for some of our clients here. Also looking into durability of um, the kind of fabric they produce as well. You can pick and choose. And also um, I'm hoping that we can have uh, more good fashion schools. Also that the government will really start to sit down with designers and think of how they can help designers to export what we produce here to the world. If they can do that, I mean, you, you, Nigeria, Nigeria will take over the world. I'm telling you, we love fashion. We took to the streets to hear directly from the students and future entrepreneurs. I'm still a student and um, I patronize all these um, roadside boutiques and maybe a friend as a designer. There was a, lot, there was a time I saw shoes made in Aba. I couldn't believe it was Aba made shoes because they were all amazing, nice. The shoe soles are strong and our leathers are on point. We need to work more on our quality assurance and finishings. Actually, talk of the finishing, the finishing side of Nigerian, most of the Nigerian uh, fashion items are not really up to the standard. We have locally good um, designers in Nigeria. As you can see, what I'm wearing was made by a local designer. If we can patronize them, they will grow in their, in their industry. We sat down with a fashion analyst to get a breakdown on the issues raised. For the industry, the fashion industry here, to get huge funding, we would need to take ourselves seriously too. We have to put in the work, we have to put in the quality, the time. The fashion industry in Nigeria is very productive. For example, Africare, which Bala Nigeria recently had a collaboration with, it's an online platform that exports products strictly made in Africa products to the rest of the world. And in a short period of time, the brand made about 2 million euros. So that's a really important milestone. In recent times, a lot of foreign brands, foreign publications have been interested in the Nigerian fashion industry, in the Nigerian fashion market. The world is watching and everybody wants a piece of that because I mean, what a time to be alive. It's always a pleasure to spend time with my friend and esteemed fashion designer, Ade Bakare. We caught up with him at one of his Lagos boutiques and learned a thing or two about his experience in fashion and in particular, the Nigerian fashion scene. What has been your journey so far in the fashion industry? Um, it's been a long journey. We set off in 1991. Uh, in London, England. Um, so I graduated from fashion uh, and then initially I studied in Nigeria at university level. I did my secondary university here in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I went back to England where I was born to go and study fashion design. So I graduated and set up in 1991. That's uh, nearly 30 years, is it? Yes, almost. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You're the grandfather of the fashion industry <laughs> in Africa. I, go I on. started very early. Yeah. And, um, and so I, because my mom had said I must study it if I wanted to make a success of uh, fashion. And because it's a career, I think that's the problem a lot of times in Nigeria, it's seen as a hobby. Uh, so um, it's, a degree, it's a degree um, status um, discipline mm. in the West. So I went to study it for two years. I had a HND. I didn't want to do another BA because I'd already done a, um, a BA in history at the University of Lagos. So I then went to the um, University of Manchester in Salford to go and study fashion design. And initially when I started, I used to do a ready-to-wear line. I used to sell to boutiques and stores across England. Um, and I started that, and then England went into a recession in the mid-90s, so I had to switch over to doing couture. So after that, I then um, branched out into wedding dresses, and that's where I became very popular with Nigerians. But as a result of that, I used to be invited for shows here in Nigeria. So gradually, I started making a lot. Each time I'd come, clients would order. And then someone said, oh, why don't you open a shop? So that's how we opened here. So a we sister here, store? Yes, okay. in uh, 2006. And then in Nigeria, which is so beautiful, I get involved in a lot of projects. So we designed the uniforms for the, uh, the defunct Virgin Nigeria, uh, uniforms for the Whitbaker Hotel, restaurants, and involved in film. 
Uh, uh -huh. So, I mean, that's it in a nutshell. But having said that, there are a lot of hurdles along the way. Yeah, because I'm a creative person, I, you know, you look at it from a creative angle. angle yes. You just want to get your designs out, out there. there. But I've always been fortunate to have business people behind me. Not so much like investing in the <clears> business, <throat> but at least giving me financial advice. You know, you have to do this. And oh. my business was actually set up by the Prince of Wales. Uh, PYBT um, had a scheme to support young entrepreneurs and so I went for um, a quick course and I was selected. And what that did, which was very beautiful, they gave you a mentor. Mm -hmm. So every month you had to submit like a statement of accounts to your mentor. Mm -hmm. And my mentor was a buyer for British Home Stores, Isabella Natanson. So I was always a bit grounded. Yeah. You know, I always knew that I had to make collections that mm -hmm. sold. And then I think when I look back now, because I was a bit young and then I was also black, I was like a novelty in England, you know, who's this black? You were black and you stood out. I want to ask you, has it been pro more, well, has it been better for you considering our oh, economic situation? Definitely. It's been good for you? Yes, in fact, so a lot of progress. my peers in England said, oh, how did I have the brain idea to mm -hmm. come to Nigeria a lot earlier then, in yes. 2006? You were brave. Yes. <laughs> but I just felt, you know, Lots of Nigerians were always ordering clothes. So you know, in England, you'd have your sketches, you, you show them to the client, they'd have one or two. Nigerians would always say they'd have everything. And, fashion uh, is our, yes. we drink and eat fashion. Isn't it? So, um, what are the challenges? Of course, you've mentioned one or two challenges. Can mm -hmm. you go give us an in-depth of the challenges you faced? I, I'll say one, one of the major challenges was having financial investment. I was never that fortunate to get financial investment. In fashion? In fashion in England. Okay. Uh, each time we'd approach financial backers, at the last minute they'd always pull out. I don't know, maybe they were just skeptical about supporting a young black uh, business. And maybe they felt, oh, he might not, because a lot of fashion businesses don't stay that long. We had a financial backer, an Indian um, financial backer. And they had gone through all my books and they'd seen I'd been in business for about, I think, five years. And they were going to put sort of millions away and I was going to have branches across England. And then at the last minute, um, I think that he developed cancer. So what they said was, he owned a perfume company. And they said, oh, they'd taken me through a long process and they'd built up my hopes. And then at the last minute when they said they could not, you know, it was just gutted. But then they said that because they have a perfume company, they would create a perfume for me. And that that perfume should then be uh, my financial backer that, you know, uh, perfumes usually sustain a lot of fashion houses. So that's how I started um, um, Bakery Breeze, the first um, perfume. Okay, and then subsequently, fun. I now have the Adi Bakery Kuchel Signature, uh -huh. uh, which was launched two years ago. Uh -huh. mm. And then the challenge is here. So the challenge is here, um, because I'd already been a bit established before I came here, I was a bit more experienced. But one of the challenges I found here were the price points. People um, found the prices a bit too high. And then also getting the right staff. Um, initially, everything, I think for the first five years we opened the shop in Nigeria, everything was brought in from England. And it was later on, um, I used to have um, some tailors. And, um, and they did see me, you know, run to England all the time to go and produce everything. So I'll never forget, one day Taylor said, well, you know, you always seem to run to England. Is it that you don't have any faith in us that we can produce these things? And I said, well, you alter them, and I appreciate that, but to make them is a different ballgame. Seamless. Ball game. And they said, no, I should try them out. You know, and I did. And I was, um, I was mesmerized, and they said, I said, oh my God, you actually understand, because I brought in my patterns for them to use. Yes. And so that's how... We started manufacturing the ready-to-wear in so Nigeria. So where do you produce? Do you produce here? Yes, here. Because oh, so I have you to be able to manage you everything. You don't, I don't bring in? A, no, we still bring in the couture, but all the ready-to-wear is done here. Done here. Yes. From the government point of view, I find that it's like, I don't think the fashion industry, they're even aware that there's a fashion industry. But they have a lot of incentives like How the is that? What do you mean? Because I, I don't think there are a lot of regulations in place. It's like you can import anything. Fabrics are brought in. A lot of the fabrics have faults. Uh, hmm. Because especially when I was doing the battleground, I had to source fabrics here. I couldn't start running to England all the time to get fabrics because that was over a year. In fact, the battleground series ran on for two years. Mm -hmm. 
And so I had to source, I had to go into Tunubu and look at you know, what they had available. Now, most of fabrics are imported into Nigeria. There's hardly anything made here anymore. But what you'd find is that they, they buy fabrics at times by the weight, so even they don't know what's inside. So, you know, you buy fabrics, they have fault <laughs> lines, don't check them you know, out things like that. that. Yes, and it, it's bad. There should be rules and regulations. Like what's brought into Nigeria it shouldn't be a dumping ground. If, if you remember at the beginning, I said problems with manufacturing. So that's why I, I, I decided to set up a fashion school. Uh, we have a fashion academy, which we started two years ago. So I trained the students, mm -hmm. and, and what I like about it is that we do it here. So it's a working environment. So they see how we deal with clients, how we cut the fabrics, you know. So basically, you're, you're learning, you know, on site rather than just have a school that's removed from the practical side of things. Because you say you try to also make ready-to-wear clothes. Yeah. People are say complaining that they don't see um, simple things, high street fashion. Yes. What we've tried to do is, um, we've got branches, I've got a branch in Abuja, and then another branch in Lekki. And what, what I try to do, and what I try to indoctrinate with the students also, and it's quite true, yes, a lot of designers just cater to the 1% or the 5%, and that's not really fashion, because fashion really is high street. Yes. You know, like Primax in England, yes. Zara and everything, they're yes. the ones who yeah. really rake it in. Mm -hmm. But that has to do with manufacturing. And because we don't even have the basics of like sort of constant light and water, it's then very difficult to set up uh, manufacturing industries. But having said that, it's not impossible. But until we do that, we're, we're, you know, we're always going to be at the mercy of like China, mm -hmm. who can produce, you know, exactly. and, you know and very low exactly. prices. What do, you, what do you make of the increasing fashion fairs? Mm. There's a lot of them at the moment. And I think from an awareness perspective, it's quite good because a lot of designers who are not known get their labels seen by a lot of people. But what you'd find when you scratch the surface is that a lot of designers who show are not even trained. You know, how do we go forward from that? So I think it's still back to basics. Mm -hmm. Let's have more fashion schools. Let's have more training, more workshops for those who are already established. Mm -hmm. So um, what would you say is a unique signature of the Nigerian fashion industry? Um, I think we are very fashionable as a people. And what, you know, I think um, Ankara has almost become like a signature thing. So they're looking, <laughs> Africa, so they're looking at Africa as a continent to see what traditional fabrics do we have here mm. that we can then contribute mm. to the international um, order. Mm. And I think um, that's where oh. we have to do a lot of exploration on African textile. Where do you hope to see the fashion industry in Nigeria in the next five years? I hope that we'll, be, we'll have a more global presence and that the designers will come up with collections mm -hmm. that are well made and are able to compete internationally mm -hmm. and would have an African influence in them. I think that's very important. Interesting how success sits easily on some people. Our next guest rose from a humble beginning and is desirous to see others follow in his steps. Vich Vitalis Ezeriako is a model, an actor, a director, and a project manager of Kilmore Foundation and joins us on the journey. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks so for having what about me. Your, what's, what's about your name, Vich? <laughs> Vich, Vich Vitalis. Uh, okay, um, Vich Vitalis is a combination of Vitalis and Chikube. Okay. Chikube is my native name. Um, so coming up, coming in the industry, um, I didn't want to be second guest mm -hmm. because I was an actor by the name Vitalis in the So I wanted to stand out and I thought about what could be the uniqueness mm -hmm. that I would create for myself. So whenever I mentioned Vich Vitalis, oh yeah. We know him. Because it's a commercial name. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, Vitalis is um, <laughs> when I wanted to be baptized, so I didn't I can't remember I don't know the name my parents gave. So the priest was like is is a white priest. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh no, this little child is so cute to be baptized by that name. Can I baptize him with my name? And my parents said, okay, fine. Oh, so he happened to be his name is Vitalis. Yeah, his name is Vitalis. Awesome. So he's wow. so he baptized me with Vitalis. So tell us about your early days. Yeah, growing up, um, <clears throat> It was quite challenging, but thank you. I thank God for my parents who were always there to caution us. I remember my mother always, always like whenever I want to go to rehearsals because back then in secondary school, I, after school I had to go for rehearsals, and coming back I come back very late. Sometimes they tell me where you're coming from. Go, go back and sleep there. there. I love the parents, man. I slept on the passage for. They are my as, role models. I slept. My <laughs> compound, they face me. I face you, right? Yeah. I slept on the passage. 
I can't, I can't remember how many times I did that. Oh, dear Lord. And just to get to where you are today. Sometimes my neighbors just take me in. Your parents were amazing. Thank you, parents. Thank you for bringing this boy up. Thank God you, Mom. You. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> Would you recall some of the tough times you had? Um, right now, do you sometimes think about how you started the tough times you must have gone through? You know, when people say, I don't have tenera, you know, the... You tell some people you don't have money, don't believe. I, I, I was in that shoe where for a week you don't have, you don't have any penny on you. Mm -hmm. You know, when, um, when you remember the word poverty, you run. I could relate why people could do anything to not to go back to poverty because it's not a good place to stay. You know, the, the depression that comes with it, the, the mental disability that you will get is not, really, is not really healthy. So let's talk about where you are now and uh, why you are part of Kilmore Foundation. Tell us about Kilmore Foundation, first of all. Why Kilmore? Because I know it's not, it's not, it's not Nigerian related. <laughs> okay, Kilmore Foundation is, is Kilmore is, is a community in Ireland who they cater for communities. Mm -hmm. They're more concerned in developing communities in very rural areas. Mm -hmm. So I was shooting a documentary for mm -hmm. Life in the Slum because I grew up in Amokoko, like I said earlier. Yes. Amokoko, really bad Jaijara. So I wanted to do a documentary that would tell the word, the story of these people. So in the process of shooting that documentary, I, I met a Reverend Father by the name um, Emmanuel Ikoko was a parish priest of St. Matthew's Catholic Church, Amukoko. He told us a whole lot of things that he's been doing for people and how he really wants to affect the, the environment. Mm -hmm. I haven't been there, I grew up there, I understand. So mm -hmm. I wanted to contribute in my own way to give back to the society. Mm -hmm. in it. So you're one of the directors of yes. the Foundation. Yeah. Awesome, amazing. So what impacts have you made so far? Yeah, the Foundation has done quite a lot like you know, like unlike other foundations, we take hundred percent responsibility for every case that we come across. Wow. Yeah. So um, we have like twenty children that are on scholarship, full time. We we'll pay hospital bills for the sick people that can't afford to go to the hospital. We also free prisoners from the prison. And um, currently, the most important one is uh, while we're shooting that documentary. There's this man we encountered who had um, five kids. The wife has been dead for two years now, had never been buried. Oh my God. So they live in this very <clears throat> detached, uh, uncompleted building. Hmm. So we are in his case, trying to give him a better life. So uh, we also do outreach, talk about, um, because the, the, the environment, the, the most common thing is drugs and child, child abuse and, um, and teenage, teenage pregnancy. pregnancy. Yes. Yeah, so we, we're running a campaign about teenage pregnancy and also go to secondary schools to, to enlighten the girls. You've done so well. I mean, this alone has just, you've just made my whole day. <laughs> so <laughs> tell <laughs> us about your actor, I mean, you being an actor in Tinsel. When did you start up with Tinsel? I started, um, well, the, the quest is, um, to Tinsel started 2012. Okay. I remember though, I, I went for the audition, so I got called back. So I was so excited, like, okay, yeah, this is it. And only for me to get there, and um, it was an extra, extra role. Okay. Well, you must start from somewhere. Yeah, you must start from somewhere. But I, personally, I had, um, I loved Tinsel so much because of their professionalism and yes. uh, the standard of acting. So I wanted to, I wanted to do more there. So, I mean, so I got there, I was just what, acting the bar, and I turned it down for the first time, okay. 2012. 2014, I turned it down again because I didn't want what they were, mm -hmm. what they were offering me. Mm -hmm. So, 2016 came knocking, and I answered. So, being, being as, an, as a, an actor, in what way has it been an eye-opener for you? Acting, for me, is wonderful. I like it because I, 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 I'm able to tell someone else's story without being in touch to... Mm -hmm. To, to the story, to, the, to that person's life. Awesome. Your parents are still alive? Yeah, they are still alive. And they have seen you, the, how grown and how successful you've become. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bridge, for sharing your amazing story. I mean, it's an eye opener for me and some of the audience too who is listening to this. You, you are truly blessed. Thank, Thank you. you and God bless your parents. Thank you. This 
say that good things come to those who wait and there's certainly something gracious and mature about the caliber of designers and specialists like Ade Bakare, Frank Osodi and others who have gone through the process of training and development rather than cutting corners. It seems to breed a quality of humility of wanting to carry others along, perhaps because of the experience teaches them not to lose sight of their beginnings. My question is this, why have we become a nation of people who cut corners rather than perfect the process? We don't seem to want to put in the, the time and investment, yet we want to reap the dividends. Our fashion industry is clearly blossoming. Lagos is on the map of a fashion capital, hosting international fashion exhibitions and increasingly exporting our home brands. Like many of us, I'm passionate to see this industry come into its own in quality, not just quantity of produce. The key surely lies in the up and coming designers, producers, marketers, and so on. Today's trainees will be tomorrow's teachers. For the sake of prosperity, we must embrace not just a culture of specializing, but also of giving back as with the Kinabuti Sisters and Kilmore Foundation. With that, we will see a generation of entrepreneurs and specialists who, like good wine, allow themselves to become mature and enriched with time and process. That's all we can pack into this week's edition of Mona Lisa. Till the next time, when we are sure to bring you another engaging lineup, remember, the good you do for others is like lighting a candle. It makes the world a brighter place. <laughs>